Hi, everyone. Welcome to the And God Said podcast. I'm your host, Reverend Kimberly Constant, and this podcast is something I offer in conjunction with a Bible study I teach called Cover to Cover, in which we read through and study every book of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But you're also welcome to just listen to this podcast on its own merits. But if you're interested in the study, you can visit my website, KimberlyConstantMinistries.com, and there's more information there. I provide a reading plan, discussion questions, and just a little more insight into these books of the Bible. So today we are going to set the scene for the next two books. We are studying First and Second Kings. And like First and Second Samuel, these were originally one book, so I have combined them for our purposes as well. These uh, setting the scene lectures are meant to situate you, give you a little bit of background, and help kind of point out some things to look for as you're reading through um, this section of the Bible. <clears throat> so let's look at From Riches to Rags, setting the scene for First and Second Kings. So if we're going to situate ourselves in history, we're covering a ton of history in these two books. We kind of slowed things down. We went, you know, pretty fast through creation and then uh, through the, even the time of the patriarchs and the beginnings of the people ending up in Egypt. Then we really slowed things down to receive the law and to learn about Moses' journey, the wandering in the desert, Joshua's conquest sped up a little bit in the time of the judges, and now we're going to cover something like 500 years of history. So we're beginning somewhere around uh, 1025-ish, 1050-ish, somewhere in there, and by the time we're done, we're going to be in 586 BC. So quite a bit of history packed into these two books. So the author is unknown. Uh, some scholars have suggested names like Jeremiah, who is a prophet, Ezekiel, or Ezra, all prophets. We'll see their books later in our reading journey, uh, but there's nothing definitive and nothing that really points to one author over another. Whoever the main author was, as with all books in the Old Testament, this one would have seen contribution from other people as well. So there's usually like a main voice, but also scribes inserting material, editors coming along at a later date and kind of shaping and maybe adding another story or two. And so it's a lot of people that are contributing to these books that we're reading. Most likely it was put into written form or at least its final written form sometime during the time of exile, so around 575-60 BC. And that's why, again, these names have been suggested, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Ezra, because they were all living at that time period. Uh, and like I said, like First and Second Samuels, originally this was one united book. It, they get separated just because of practical reasons for length for the length of scrolls in the time when the Bible uh, was being copied. And so they turned it into two books, what was originally one ongoing story. The genre, we find mostly histi historiography here uh, with, like we saw in First and Second Samuel, a continued focus on the nation. It's a big picture story of Israel. We're going to see national events, national leaders, uh, for in these two books, the kings of both Israel and then the northern and southern kingdom when Israel splits into two. We'll also see some material about the prophets, Elijah and Elisha. They have actually quite a lot of material dedicated to them. Some We'll see some other prophets that don't have as much written about them. Um, but again, if this is all leadership. We're not going to encounter the stories of everyday Israelites unless those people come into contact with one of our national leaders and that does happen so there will be some ordinary people that pop up but we're really following the thread of israel as a whole and we'll see the story of israel as a nation continued uh, if we thought about you know its infancy and young youngster years being that time in the desert that time with moses then they had their teenage years in the book of judges and now they're entering into kind of their middle to late age here. Uh, and so we're going to see 
um, the beginning of their demise and the events that end up causing its complete collapse and the exile of all of its people. So this is really the end of the story of the nation of Israel, not the Israelites. Their story continues, but the nation itself is going to come to an end here, uh, at least as it was in the Old Testament times, not including modern day Israel, of course, and that. So the structure, let's look at first Kings. Um, the first 11 chapters are going to cover King Solomon's reign. This is David's son, and he reigns over a united Israel as did his father. So he'll be established as king. We'll see some good years from Solomon and then things fall apart. And that leads to the division of Israel into two kingdoms. And so chapters 12 through 22, really the second half of first Kings looks at the divided kingdom with most of the fo focus on the northern kingdom, uh, a little bit on the southern as well, but really most of the material here will talk about this northern kingdom of Israel. Then in 2 Kings, uh, we'll continue to see at the beginning anyway, the two kingdoms and a focus on the northern kingdom. And then uh, the northern kingdoms exiled about halfway, a little more than halfway through the story. And then the focus is solely on the southern kingdom and they are exiled by the end of the story. And that's how <laughs> that's how these books end. Not a cheery ending for us. So let's um, look at the different kings. So if you are able to access the PDF or watch the YouTube video of this lecture, I have a slide that shows you the different leaders and it puts them side by side. Because once the kingdom is divided after Solomon's reign, it gets confusing because they flip back and forth. There'll be whole chunks where they're looking at the northern kingdom and then all of a sudden they switch to the kings of the southern kingdom and their reigns overlap each other. So this chart is a good one to just kind of, even if you can print it out or make a note somewhere, it'll help you as you read through the Bible and the story of these kings mm -hmm. to keep everything situated in your minds. Who's who? What part of the kingdom am I in? And I also just always like to point out that there was one queen um, for the southern kingdom, Athalia, and she reigns um, in place of her son for about six years. So I made a note on the chart to show you which uh, where she falls, but uh, Queen Athalia. So everybody else is a guy, one queen. So themes that you will find as you're reading, uh, a big focus on honor and shame. This is prevalent in this type of a society. Uh, name matters, reputation matters. It matters almost more than money. And we'll see this continue into the New Testament. Even in the time of Jesus, honor and shame is a huge dynamic that governs the way that they interact with each other as people. And you'll see that here as well. And of course, the honor and shame is really be, uh, being assigned by the author. So notice what he estimates or he or she, if there was even a she that might have contributed at some point. But what the author is, is saying about each ruler, uh, was the ruler good or was the ruler evil? That's the honor and shame being assigned. We'll see a continued look at corporate sin and the consequences of that sin. We saw that in first and second Samuel as well. But since we're focusing on Israel, the nation and the big picture, we're looking at what happens when they betray the covenant. Uh, when that kind of corporate sin happens, what are the consequences? Is God going to follow through with what he said he would do? Uh, we also see continued generational sin. A lot of the kings are said to not just be evil, but to do evil, sometimes even more evil than their fathers before them. So generational sin has this almost exponential factor where the next generation does even worse than the generation before it. There are a few good kings, <laughs> not many. There's a few that do kind of reverse course, uh, but a lot of times we see that. It's just the sin that was begun with the father is just even exponential with the next son. We will see God's provision, provision for the people. And this is going to be more and more through these people called the prophets. 
He gives the prophets themselves strength and courage to be able to do what he's asking them to do, which is no small thing. They have to stand up to these wicked kings and be the voice of God to the king, kind of trying to call the king back into some kind of rational behavior. Likewise, the prophets spoke to the people saying, don't follow this, turn around, repent and believe in God. And that was a tall order. And often their lives were threatened by what they did. So God, you will see, equips them with strength and courage. They provide warnings. Uh, they, they speak of God's impending punishment for the sins that are being committed. And they also speak of hope. They'll begin to talk about uh, a future in which a remnant of Israel will return and rebuild Jerusalem. So even as they're speaking words of punishment, they're also speaking words of hope. This is going to happen. You're going to get sent into exile, but God's going to make a way for some of you to come back. There's also provision of continued love and grace and mercy. Everything that we have been learning about God, God will continue to do. He has this heart's desire for people to turn back to him. God is for us. He was for the people living in this time, and he longed for them to turn and repent and to follow God and to reclaim uh, their their way of following the covenant. And you'll see his heart really expressed in that uh, desire. And then, of course, we see God's continued sovereignty, where he does allow free will, but it is his sovereign right to do so as creator of everything. But he also steps in when necessary. And in this story in particular, we're really going to see him work through foreign oppression. Because remember, the terms of the covenant were such that when God removes his hand of blessing, when the people sin, that allows all these foreign invaders to come in. And that's how judgment is, is executed. And so we're really seeing God uh, kind of stand back a little. He's not, you know, so much parting the Red Sea like he used to, although the, that does happen as through some of the stories of the prophets. But really, you're going to see him just pushing, putting the hand of blessing on them and then removing it. And what happens when that blessing gets removed. So things to notice. Um, as I said, Israel will split into two kingdoms. It gets confusing. The southern kingdom is called Judah. The northern kingdom is called Israel. <laughs> so the big Israel becomes Israel and Judah. And so once they split, when you see Israel, they're talking about the northern kingdom. The stories of the kings, as I've said, are intertwined. So there's skipping back and forth between these two kingdoms. Both kingdoms will wind up in exile, but Israel, the northern kingdom, gets taken away first. And so pay attention to that when it happens. What does God say to each kingdom? Why did Israel get taken away? Why did they go so much sooner than Judah does? Judah gets to, to stay for a while longer. Um, as the reigns of, of the kings of Israel become more and more tainted by evil, you see the prophets transition in their role. Whereas so far, like especially in First and Second Samuel, they're, they're really depicted as kind of the king's right-hand man in a way, like checking in. Um, we think of Nathan and David. When David sinned with Bathsheba, Nathan showed up and called him to account and was like, what are you doing? You're sinning. Here's the punishment that you're going to have. And David listened to him. So there was a, you know, the prophet wasn't always a yes man for the king, but there was more of a partnership. That's going to go away because the kings are just going to get, for the most part, worse and worse. And so the, the prophets are going to stop being a partner and be more of an opponent where the kings often are kind of out for blood when it comes to the prophets. There will be, as I've been saying, a few bright spots amongst the kings. So take note of who those are and what they do and don't do that makes them stand out from the rest of the wicked kings. And then note the stories of any ordinary Israelites that you find um, and compare and comp contrast those people with the rulers of Israel. Uh, when we encounter just everyday Israelites, are they the same? Are they different? Are they more faithful, less faithful? Um, remember that constant theme of unexpectedness. We saw that in First and Second Samuel. It's going to continue all the way through the Bible. God does unexpected things and chooses unexpected people. So make sure you uh, take note of that. All right. So that brings us to the end. Uh, happy reading. 
in First and Second Kings, and I'll be back with a lecture on both of those books.